Hey guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode, and I've got a fantastic guest for you today, Louise Malbray. She's a futurist. She's got um, extensive background in corporate leadership, and she's written a book, um, which we're going to talk about, talking about the future and advancements in technology and how to prepare. Um, you know, I was talking with her backstage and talking about how unprepared the world is, and I'm really happy to have you. Um, a futurist and leader have bring her insights on the show. So, Luis, welcome. Thank you, Christopher. It's it's wonderful to be here. Yeah, I know we were we were kind of discussing, you know, kind of um, diversifying geographically. And you're in South Africa, you know, originally from UK. And so, talk about your journey and what led you to, um, you know, write your book. And um, I'm really excited to delve into the conversation with you. Thanks, Christopher. I'll, I'll try and keep it short and sweet because it's been quite a journey. But I got luckier. I was born in um, Cape Town to British parents. And so I grew up in South Africa, which I think is was just an amazing um, place to grow up for, from so many different perspectives. I moved to the UK and moved to London in my early 20s. And I went where everybody goes, investment banking and then technology. <laughs> and I think when you're young, you just want to earn enough to make sure you can travel and see the world and, you know, um, enjoy yourself. So that, that was kind of the focus. And, and then I um, joined an executive search firm, a global listed executive search firm. And I found I was quite good at it, um, which surprised me, to be honest, because most of my colleagues were at least 20 years older than me an ex-C-suite of, of some major organization. And um, that was kind of the golden thread that really clicked things into place for me when it comes to people, um, leadership, cultures, organizations, and growth. And I then founded an executive search firm with a couple of partners at the rise of the new economy. And we worked purely with the venture capital, capital community. So the organizations that they funded the startups um, and really ramping them up um, according to funding milestones. And then the markets crashed and I probably had to make one of the most difficult decisions ever. And we shut the business and paid redundancies rather than running it into the ground. And uh, I then lived in the Middle East, uh, based in Dubai for about three and a half years where I did something completely different. I was managing director for a British uh, luxury lifestyle company and I built up their operations across the Middle East, North Africa. So that was another fantastic, extraordinary experience, getting to know the region really well, um, a region I didn't particularly know at all before I started. Went back to London, and then, of course, the major question was, what on earth am I going to do? And with the absolute determination, I was only going to do what I was deeply passionate about. And I started the business I have today, which is um, now 19 years old. And I'm lucky to be able to still call myself a teenager <laughs> when it comes to business age anyway. And um, the extraordinary thing about the last 19 years is the world has changed enormously. My clients have changed enormously. I've changed enormously. And what's needed today is vastly different to what's needed five years ago, 10, 20, 30. You know, it, it, you can almost sort of take it in tranches and what we're gonna need in the next five to 10. So I'm constantly energized by um, what's going on around us and finding better way, ways to help my clients to navigate it with more ease. Yeah, that's a fantastic introduction. And uh, it kind of reminds, you actually remind me of myself when in the early 2000s, you know, cause you've seen the world and from a different lens and you get the Middle East and, you know, here, like, you know, I grew up in a US centric and it's kind of like the media pushes this narrative. And, you know, when, when actually like 2008 and COVID and you kind of start to see what's actually happening, uh, you know, in the, in, in real time. So, um, you know, the question, the question is, you know, what is, what is the, I, I mean, there's a lot of problems in the world, but what is the, you, you talk about how unprepared we are and what, what, what are the causes of that? Like, um, you know, is it government? Is it the media? You know, you just look, you look around everywhere. The world is, is very in disarray. Um, talk about that. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, as, as we were chatting um, before we got on this, um, got onto Zoom, I think that one needs to have a sense of what's happened 
in the past and what's going on today and also an awareness about what's coming without judgment. And I know that's really tricky because wherever we come from, we are conditioned all the way through our lives. And, you know, we understand life through a series of lenses and your lenses, even if we grew up in the same town and went to the same school, um, would be vastly different just because that's the nature of human beings. I sometimes think of the sort of the big why question as the existential question. You know, it's we can spend forever going down rabbit holes and, you know, exploring the why. And, and sometimes I think that, you know, what we've got to do is take a step back, almost take an umbrella view and step up and go, okay, it is what it is. You know, what's going on? It, give it a name, call it what it is. And how can I best prepare myself for what's to come? I think the tricky thing is when we get too attached to what we want it to be, <laughs> or what we think it should be, or how we think it should be, or who should do what. And so, th so this kind of almost non-attachment to develop that mental space, that space in our minds between what's going on out there and a considered response um, so that I can actually take a look at stuff and make better decisions ultimately. So I think that's the big challenge rather than the, the why. Otherwise, we would be here for days just talking politics and you know, the way the world works, which I think fundamentally, you know, for as long as people don't fundamentally change, um, all that's changing are the tools that we're using, the technologies that we're using. And uh, and that has changed. How we go about doing what we do has changed vastly. There is no chance of it slowing down. I think we just need to accept <laughs> what, what we've got and what's coming and, uh, you know, get prepared, really. Yeah. And one, one common thing among futurists is um, just kind of uh, seeing where where we are and where things are headed and kind of preparing and having um, tools. So um, one thing is uh, talking about is, we, you know, we've got technology and we've got blockchain and AI coming. So um, how do you envision the future of work and, you know, based on, you know, what you wrote in your book and especially with these, uh, with, you know, kind of um, infrastructure changing technology such as AI um, and this kind of shifting, you know, more people are remote work, working for themselves. How do you, how do you see that? So what does work look like in the future? So, so I come at things from a, a perspective of, I, I'm a, an executive coach. I advise and coach, you know, executive teams and work with individual leaders and of course deliver keynotes and everyone wants to know about AI and things like that and, and actually create and deliver multi-session masterclasses, especially for executive teams around this very topic. I think being a futurist as well and understanding things like complexity and wayfinding and sense making ultimately allows us to have a look at what's at play because you mentioned blockchain, but blockchain has been around for quite some time. You know, it's not brand new. And apart from trading in crypto, we haven't used it to the extent that we will, I believe, in the future. So we've got a whole convergence of a bunch of technologies coming together at the same time, which makes today feel unbelievably chaotic and difficult to, to fathom. And I I think when we look at AI, we've got to understand that AI is really about a sort of almost transactional type scenario. We've been using AIs, transactional AIs, for years and years. Every single thing that we do, whether you order a takeout or you try and figure out where your friend lives on a map or uh, it, whether you give it voice commands. And of course, today we're playing with Gen AI, LLMs in lots of different forms. Um, but I think that this, this ability to use AI to ramp up some of the technologies that are perhaps not as sexy, but are happening and bubbling away in the background. Um, nanotechnologies, you know, biotech, all of the big stuff that ultimately probably will alter um, things in a major way for us going forward is being sort of damped down by the noise of Gen AI. And of course, you know, something new comes along and we are literally like rabbits caught in the headlights because we don't quite know how it's going to alter our businesses, how much of our sort of, I guess, repetitive tasks in our business lives it'll replace. Um, will it replace me? You know, am I going to become redundant is the big question. And I think that a lot of the fear that plays out through the media, look, I mean, there's only one way 
that media sells. And that's with, you know, outstanding headlines that um, ultimately, you know, could cause some sort of fear response. I mean, we know that there are endless studies around this. So one of the best um, pieces of advice I ever heard was from a neuroscientist who said that she and her neuroscience colleagues, um, not one of them will watch the news. In other words, no video and no sound. They'll tap into the written word. They'll tap into investigative journalists who are doing a good job at unearthing what's going on right across you know, all of our economic sectors and things we, we need to know about. Um, but of course, the big thing would be politics and society. So I think if you want to do yourself a favor and develop your critical thinking and ability to filter what's coming at you so that you can make sense of it, start by reading, not watching. <laughs> you know, at least you're not going to get that visceral fear response. But I think in terms of what's coming, right now, Christopher, I could have sent you my, I don't know, um, hologram to come and have this conversation with you. I mean, it's perfectly possible today, but would you want that? Would my clients want me to send a hologram of myself to attend their meeting? I think, you know, technology, what we're capable of today is right there. You know, we th there is so much that we're capable of. But the question is, do we want it? And in this whole question about, you know, technology and what parts of our lives it's going to augment or replace or, you know, what one would hope support, because that should be that, you know, we need to place humans at the center of all of this. Um, the question is, do we actually want it? And that always dictates the adoption of these technologies into our lives. So when it comes to, will AI replace me? Unlikely right now. And um, the other thing we've got to remember is that a lot of the solutions on the market today were only startups five minutes ago. So, you know, of course, as with all new bright, shiny things, some will fall away, some will, some will last. And um, I think the only advice I can give people is don't sit on the sidelines like some accidental tourist wondering what on earth's gone on. Get involved, take a course. LinkedIn is packed full of free courses that you can take on wrapping your head around how to use these tools and begin to understand it so that you can actually look at your business and um, be really smart about how you use it. Um, bearing in mind that the biggest issues around all of this will be ethics and values. And um, what does it mean for you? If it's something you would actually be happy for your children to use, fine, use it in your business. But if it isn't, don't use it, you know, certainly with your employees and your customers. Yeah, that's a fantastic discussion about AI because, you know, the other day I was just playing around and I was able to clone my voice and I was able to upload a picture of me and I was able to deliver a five-minute webinar um, you know, which is really amazing, you know, what you can do. Um, yeah. And in, in terms of educating yourself and especially today's leadership, we were talking about the political climate and um, just, um, you know, the lack of trust in institutions. Um, you know, where does the next generation of leaders, how do they, um, uh, obviously, you know, I turn on the news, I'm like, yeah, this is, this is, you know, propaganda. Um, you know, you talked about reading books. So how do people prepare for leadership, um, especially Gen Z, um, you know, the younger generations? Yeah, it's it's really interesting, actually, because if we even look at a younger generation, Gen, Gen Alpha, I mean, this is the first generation that are truly do not know a life without technology. In fact, they, they kind of got trained early on where they spent their early formative years, not in nursery school or primary school but um, at home, <laughs> so, uh, you know, during the pandemic. So we, we've got a whole raft of young people coming through that um, really do care about the world that they are inheriting. They're very aware of climate change. They're very aware of the issues they're going to have to deal with in the future. And they're uncompromising about yeah, I, you know, I, I think that the, there's a vast difference between people who've come through a system and uh, perhaps have had to make their way by, you know, pleasing everybody around them. And it's a different paradigm in terms of leadership. But today's young people, that's, that's not the deal at all. And as with any sort of generational change aided by um, technologies, actually how we think is very different. If you look at neural pathways under an MRI of a person perhaps who's middle-aged versus somebody in their 20s, how we process information is very different. 
So I think we've got to make an effort to communicate and use each other's um, thinking and talents to the best of our abilities. But this whole new wave of leadership coming through, we're talking about young people who um, essentially technology is part of their lives. And why would they come into a business and do repetitive tasks endlessly um, that you know, are not interesting, they're not learning. I mean, why do people, we've got to go back to basics here. You know, what does humanity want? When we take a job, we're interested in learning and earning and getting ahead. And, you know, there are a whole bunch of other little things like, you know, we need recognition and we need to have some purpose and meaning. In other words, in other words, it needs to satisfy some greater desire um, to learn and grow and earn at the same time. So, you know, when we're looking at perhaps having to redesign, I mean, not perhaps having to, but, you know, having to redesign how we go about building our organizational cultures and structures, not only to serve our clients, but to attract top talent, we really shouldn't be thinking about where we've come from and where we are. We should be thinking about where we are and where we're going, because the future of work um, will be aided by AI and a whole bunch of other things. So I would say to leaders where the, this is not familiar to them and it's not their world yet, get involved. It really isn't complicated and it's easy to wrap your head around and then start talking to younger people and understand that how they think is gonna be translated into how they want to work. Yeah, it's quite interesting because I was um, I read this statistic that um, you know, especially it started with millennials, and they were willing to like, for example, they would go to a coffee shop and they would pay you know six or seven dollars for a coffee when they could get easily get it for like one or two dollars. And the reason why they pay that five dollars difference is because it's good for the environment or it's you know for a good cause, and that's um, really interesting. So. Um, Talk about your, uh, what's really interesting is you talked about this um, convergence of exponential technologies, which uh, Peter Demandis and Kathy Wood, they talk about all these in uh, Ray Kurzweil. And your book, you know, your um, talk about your book, um, how can people find it, the central thesis and kind of um, what the audience's appetite. Yeah, so, so this book has come together over, you know, the last forever. <laughs> And I think that as um, time's gone on, I mean, I took a, uh, my first course in futures in 2017, I think. And I've done a whole lot of stuff in behavioral science and, you know, perhaps in more, more recent years, things around complexity, sense making, wayfinding, along with all of the, you know, the, the leadership stuff that we need um, to be able to build great companies, um, profitable companies. It's based around five different lenses. I mean, it's really difficult for me to put it to a sort of a, a synopsis, but essentially it's five different lenses that I believe that every leader, it doesn't matter where they are in their um, leadership journey, leaders at all levels, entrepreneurs, it doesn't matter what you do. I think that these five lenses are vital. And when I say lens, you know, we understand the world through our experience. We understand the world through our schooling systems and our first jobs and what it was like at home and the country we grew up in and the nature of the environment that we were in. And, you know, we always believe that, you know, the way I understand the world is the way everybody understands the world. And clearly that's not the case. It's vastly different, you know, region to region, culture to culture, company to company, uh, and leader to leader. So when I talk about lens, it's, I'm really talking about how we understand, how we filter the world. And these five lenses, the first one is conscious leadership. So I specialize in conscious leadership and conscious business, which I have done since about 2010. And thank goodness, conscious leadership is finally having a moment. I think before it was a nice to have, but uh, today I, I think we understand that it's absolutely vital. And certainly young people get it. You know, it, it's, it's kind of automatically baked in. The second is um, systems thinking, because until we actually understand how the world is interconnected in ways that we might not have thought of before, um, we're really not going to be able to you know, build in risk management into our businesses, understand what the future looks like. I mean, an event on the other side of the world, and we, you know, we never thought in systems before, the events of the last five years have made us all aware of systems. 
So, you know, a war, Russia's war on Ukraine, suddenly, of course, you get to the supermarket checkout and your, you know, your basket of food has doubled in price two, two years later. Um, or, you know, Hamas's attack on Israel, which of course led to the Houthis bombing the canal, which led to, you know, internet lines going down um, around the east coast of Africa. So we've got all of these knock-on effects that when we think in systems, we can begin to track and trace and connect dots and understand how something on the other side of the world or next door can impact our business, our ability to grow, and our need to shift and change and adapt um, our strategy and what we're aiming for. Because, you know, if we if we had a plan, I mean, old school sort of linear strategy, five-year deal, um, suddenly that's just thrown out and uh, we need to be able to adapt really quickly. And of course, futures thinking teaches us to create those multiple futures in, you know, and to understand where we are at so that we can actually adapt pretty quickly, which is the third thing. And um, so futures thinking, strategic foresight, also really important. The other thing is agile thinking and innovative behaviors, because we often talk about innovation. In fact, it's been probably the only flavor for the last sort of 10, 15 years. And yet innovation is a byproduct. It's the outcome. If we land up with an innovation, it means that a bunch of other things have happened well. But without creating the environment for innovative behaviors in our organizations, we're in trouble. So, you know, that, that's another, that's another um, key topic. And um, yeah, I think that pretty much covers the five key lenses that, um, that I focus on. But that only comes in part four in the book, because the first three parts are all about understanding yourself, understanding your organization and other people and understanding about what's going on in the world. And until we create that awareness and that ability to connect those dots, it's very difficult to create that conscious space in our own minds so that when stuff goes on in the world or changes happen, you know, literally without any notice, which seems to be a constant in our, in our world today, that we can be agile and we can respond rather than you know, thinking of it as a, uh, everything as a threat. Really interesting. The one you were describing that really reminds me of the early 2000s because that's when I was a med student and I, and I figured that was pretty much set. But then, you know, 9-11 uh, happened and, um, you know, I was seeing all these changes in healthcare and I was like, I should better, I better start preparing. Otherwise, I'm going to be SOL and, um, you know, uh, really interesting. And how can people find you and, and follow you? Because I know you, you've got a lot of really great experience and a lot of innovative ideas, giving keynotes and, you know, uh, consulted with, you know, uh, major corporations, clients, and how can they uh, learn more about you? Yeah, thanks, Christopher. I think the first thing is my website. So that'll pretty much um, fill you in in terms of whatever area of interest um, you might have. And that's mowbraybydesign.com. Um, the second thing is you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, probably the the only business platform we need we need some competition but it's the only business platform that we're all using and then my book is on amazon and all good online booksellers and it's called um relevant future focused leadership uh and if you if any you know if any of your listeners do read it i'd love to hear their thoughts i'd love to hear how um, this applies to their lives and and what they get out of it yeah, and then check it out. And uh, for all the audience, be sure to check out Louise's books and you know, socials, give her a like and follow and uh, really in very interesting conversation with the futurist and uh, influencer thought leader. And thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you, Christopher. It's been a great pleasure.